Hello, everybody. Thank you, Michael Gately. I'm Edward Ball, the uh, panel chair of this event. I want to begin with a benediction. It's Sunday, March 15, 2022, and yesterday in Buffalo, a white supremacist killed 10 African Americans. I want to acknowledge them. I want to mourn for them. And I want to mourn for us as a society in which white supremacy has fueled our history from the inception of the United States. And which like a succubus has bedeviled us down. It reminded me of a shooting in one of my hometowns, Charleston, South Carolina. 2015, in which a white supremacist killed nine African Americans. Not at all dissimilar. A manifesto and a young man. Thanks. Blessings on the people who died in Buffalo. Blessings on their families. The headline for this panel and conversation is a biography of families and a family member. It is both sexy and disreputable. Sexy because who is not interested in family stories and secrets, shameful things and righteous things. It is disreputable because history with a capital H condescends to family history, positioning it below other forms of nonfiction. The genre has roots in the 19th century. Sources that give family history the taint of myth-making. Its early practice is writing that amplifies a family's prestige. Storytelling that living members of once important clans used to reify their status, to claim good stock among Northern Europeans and to signal virtue. Family history grows popular in the U.S. from just before the Civil War till long after. Today, family history has a populist companion, which is genealogy. And the two of them together form a kind of mega discourse. Genealogy is amateur history by the million. It makes family storytelling into an identity building board game. Starting 150 years ago, historical societies arose, collecting family papers from former colonial elites, made marginal by industrialization and the rise of a merchant bourgeoisie. In the South, such libraries appeared and they would house the papers of former slaveholding families. Today, after work, Historians on Ancestry.com look for family members of high reputation in the past and show how well things went for them. Or they look for ancestors of low reputation in the past and show how they faced all kinds of bad stuff. The reason that I'm here, I think, is because I've committed acts of family history at least twice I wrote a book published in 2020 called Life of a Klansman, which told the story of a man in my mother's family in New Orleans who was a Klansman during the years of Reconstruction. It's a biography of a Klansman. And an earlier book of mine, Slaves in the Family, told the story of my father's people in South Carolina, where they were major slaveholders for 170 years, as well as telling the stories of 10 African-American families from slavery down to the present, people whom my family once enslaved. So family history, though it has some weak roots, is full of ways to recruit readers. It's a genre where the reader's identification with characters and with circumstances faced by historical actors drives the experience. Readers of family history really care about what happens to characters. 
The authors here on this panel have written within the genre of family history, but far from the I am from good stock variety. We're going to hear from Bernice Lerner, Jenny Conant, and Rachel Swarns. Each panelist has written about a family whose members become characters and whose fate the reader really wants to learn about. Two have written about part, parts of their own family, and a third about somebody else's. Bernice Lerner writes narrative nonfiction that is nearly novelistic. Her characters have traits, a type of speech, and distinguishing gestures. Now, how she achieves her detached, omniscient voice, at least for a time in the book that we'll hear about, while also writing about atrocities that befell her family is an enigma. Jeanette Conant has written a number of books of nonfiction narrative and history, and among them is one family history. Jeanette is a person blessed with the accident of having an influential predecessor, a forebear whose life she chooses to write about. That is one way of dealing with a powerful figure to whom one is related. Rachel Swarns has taught at NYU in journalism for several years. She wrote for the New York Times for many years, and she writes about families other than her own. Rachel is going to, at least I hope, she said she's going to say how she does that, because most of us in family history are completely self-absorbed and prefer just to gaze in the mirror, telling our own stories, doing me-search. But Rachel tells a significant story, one that's significant to the country. In these three books by these three writers, we have something of a survey of the last 100 years. Speaking only a little reductively, we have a story about the camps, we have a story about the bomb, and we have a story about white supremacy. That is a major chord of themes. Bernice Lerner, would you like to take the microphone and start things off? Sure, thank you so much, Edward. Um, and thank you to all who are here. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Can hear me, okay. Um, in my case, um, I did not write about uh, a family member who was a notable standout figure who made a major contribution in some way, uh, who's famous. I didn't actually set out to write about her. It's about my mother. Um, but I will explain, explain how that came about. So I'm going to now share my screen. And let's see. So um, I wrote a book called, the uh, US version is called All the Horrors of War. The UK version, which was published simultaneously was called To Meet in Hell. And um, the text is the same, the images are the same, but you can see that the publishers had very different concepts for the book. But I really, I, I, my first uh, biography was a group biography of seven Holocaust survivors who became academics in their post-war lives, who really, who, and who achieved great things. I didn't write about anybody in my family and I had no intention ever of writing about anyone in my family. I actually set out to write this book because I, I, was inter I became interested in the question of how my mother survived the Holocaust. And she had fallen unconscious at the very end of the war after the liberation. She had actually been beaten to a pulp by her fellow compatriots. No one had laid their hands on her, no SS officer during the entire war. And after the war, she was beaten up and fell unconscious and she could not tell me how she was actually rescued, how, how, how she had a fighting chance of surviving. So that led me to the story of the liberation, the mechanics of the rescue, the ethics of the rescue, and this man, Brigadier Glenn Hughes. And I set out to write a biography of Glenn Hughes, which you could see at the bottom here. He's startled by the cameraman and up here, you can see the setting better. He's in his caravan at Bergen-Belsen, which is the concentration camp where my mom was at the end of the war and where the largest number 
of remaining survivors was at the end of the war. And of course, thousands, tens of thousands of dead already. And here's a picture of my mom. And you can see that she is her, she has a sad look in her eye. She's orphaned. Uh, she lost her parents and her four younger siblings in Auschwitz. Only she and an older sister survived. And she is really sick here. She has tuberculosis. And um, this is in snowy Northwest Sweden in a tuberculosis sanitarium. And here's, here's a full image of her, not with the right background. This is the sanatorium, but here she is. You can see that she's already um, well nourished and her bruises are gone. And this is about seven months after the war's end, but it's not your happy figure. So um, I, I set out to write about Glenn Hughes. Um, a lot of people were asking me about my mom along the way. And I thought, can I try and write this dual biography? And how do I go about writing about my, my mom? And I, I sort of, um, the way I did it was I sort of removed myself from the story. I tried really hard to remove the me and look at her at this kid, like she was the same age as Anne Frank. And what if Anne Frank's story had continued? What if her, she wrote a second part to her diary? How does a 15 year old uh, view these, such, this circumstance and go through this? And I, so I, I took myself out of it and I looked at this little girl who went through this. And um, this is, I have no pictures of my mom from before the war. There's nothing that we have that exists. But here is the very first image I have of my mom here. She's 15 years old and you can still see sort of the vacant look in her eyes and the black and blue marks under her eyes. And here she is, she is, this is the first time that she gets really personalized medical attention. She's in a makeshift hospital in Sweden. Um, and there she is. And all these girls are teenage survivors of the war. And these are the uh, medical personnel attending to them. So how does she get from this point here to about seven years later, this point here? So, um, so that is part of the story that I tell. And part of that story is, um, is how um, there's a lot of side stories. Every little story that my mom shared with me in the course of my growing up, little little hints became windows into much bigger stories as I began to research the context that she navigated. But I'm just gonna give you an example of one of them really quickly. Um, one of the things, one of the ways my mom sort of slowly came back to life was that she had this opportunity to be in this small international school with um, teenage survivors. Um, the Swedish government decided that those who, who came to Sweden should have some form of education. So here she is, this is a picture of her with her group. There was about 50 um, young women here. Most of the time, I have to say, for the uh, 10 years after the war, my mother was in and out of tuberculosis sanitarium and rest homes. But she did have this seven months that really changed her life forever, being with these great people and great teachers. So here's my here's my mother, and it's, she's at a costume party. And this is my um, this is at this school in B2B, Sweden, which um, I wound. Up, this is the um, headmaster, Ali Gatroy, and he wrote a thesis for his a doctoral thesis on working with. Um, young survivors of concentration camps and bringing them back to life and sort of the how the psychology of teaching the refugee who is the young person who has seen such horrors. And this is one of my absolute favorite pictures because you saw the early pictures of my mom and here she is, she's 16 years old and she is smiling and loving this opportunity to learn having missed so much schooling on account of the war. And fast forward six years, um, here's my mom. She's one of only two or three women in this business school and um, where she also, part of her or part of her journey and sort of coming back to life before she had me, before she had my sister, before she married and had children, she did sort of come back to a productive sort of adulthood an orphan trying to make her own way. But here she is in business school. And here is the Royal Dramatic Theater in Sweden where she had a past and she loved, she was encouraged at the former school to see shows and take herself sort of out of herself and partake of great culture. 
And fast forward, uh, here's a picture of my mom with her sister in Sweden, they're young ladies, and our wedding picture to my dad. And here's my dad, he's also a survivor. And here he is in the displaced persons camp. And I am contemplating writing a book about him. I'm gathering materials now. And here's my mom today. And she speaks to school groups all over the world about her experiences. So I'm going to stop my share now and pass it along to the, to the next person. You're going to hear some fascinating um, biographies. Thank you very much, Bernice. Um, Jeanette, I wonder if you would take the microphone and talk to us a bit about one of your books. Well, uh, I, uh, I've committed many acts of <laughs> biography, as you put it. I started, uh, I guess I started by practicing on other people. Um, but a little bit like Bernice, my family constantly was entangled um, in these other war stories. I've written a sixth, one of my seventh book about World War II. And um, I like to write about people who become caught up in the war and how it affects their lives. And what happened was that various uncles and grandfathers and great grandfathers kept popping up in the stories. And I think like Bernice, you, you then you, 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 you suddenly realize that perhaps you're being compelled to write about your own family. And then, then you have to wrestle with how to do that. Um, when I was working on one of my first books, which was about another family, the, the Loomis family, I had a neighbor who was a very famous uh, writer on the Upper West Side named Nora Ephron. And she was encouraging me to be bold and have the courage to write about my own family, no matter how difficult or frightening it felt. And she said, if you can survive your own family, you have material for life. And uh, I think she was right, certainly in my case. Um, and I think that really what happened to me was that the stories that I heard gr growing up about the war, the very fierce debates um, about the bomb, which my grandfather um, helped create and uh, made the fateful decision to drop on Hiroshima to end the war. Uh, you know, it was the crucible that sort of um, formed who I became and my approach to the world and really my enduring interests. So as I got older, um, those stories that I heard growing up um, told by all of these uh, physicists and chemists from Harvard and MIT, I grew up really in the backyard of those universities in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, those stories stayed with me and I became a journalist and, and went into very different areas and was a magazine writer. And yet um, these stories would come back to me all the time. You know, these were amazing men. They were marvelous storytellers. They had great insight into what had happened to them. And I couldn't shake it off. And I found that I was ultimately compelled to look into these stories and get beyond the sort of family anecdotes and to the cold hard history, a sort of reckoning. Um, my grandfather was appointed as a young man uh, to make uh, weapons of mass destruction in World War I. As a young chemist for Harvard, he made poison gas um, in large quantities um, to send to Europe mustard gas because the Germans were developing it and we felt we had to help our allies and then again in World War II, as president of Harvard, an academic leading a quiet life on a leafy campus, he was summoned by Roosevelt to uh, head the Manhattan Project, the giant weapons project of World War II to mobilize science um, in this country to build weapons. And he personally oversaw the Manhattan Project, the development of the atom bomb. And as I said, was a member of the small presidential committee that determined that it would be dropped on Hiroshima and then Nagasaki to bring the Pacific War to an end. Um, those decisions uh, haunted my family. They were probably the undoing of my father and my uncle, uh, two very damaged men. My uncle committed suicide and my father was a very troubled person to the end of his life. Um, 
living in the shadow of that decision and a man as powerful as my grandfather was not an easy thing. And so it, it very much had an impact on my life. Um, so I think that while I wrote about other families uh, and World War II stories, I kept getting pulled back into my own. And I finally felt that if I was going to tell other family histories, then I should be brave enough to tell my own. Um, and really, I think what intrigued me was the toll. Uh, it took a, a tremendous emotional toll on my family, but perhaps a larger toll on my grandfather. You know, he was born to a Quaker mother. He was fundamentally averse to war. He was an academic scientist with hopes of winning, you know, a Nobel Prize for chemistry when he twice got called on to build weapons of mass destruction. And he wrote, you know, in his diary that he felt he had to do what his country asked uh, of him in its hour of need, but he was now dedicating himself to, he said, the hideous business of beating the devil at his own game. Um, and I think that uh, he then lived the rest of his life uh, with the legacy that he had helped create, as he put it, this potentiality for destruction that was so terrible that it would outweigh anything that he did of any good in the rest of his life. And he did much that was good. He spent 20 years as a defender of democracy and freedoms and education. But uh, he knew ultimately that he had created this nuclear weapon that would uh, make our world unsafe. And uh, that he was, you know, uh, really the, the grandfather, as it were, of the nuclear age. And so I, I found myself asking myself, how do you judge a man who dedicated his career to safeguarding democracy and the American way of life, and yet at the same time was haunted by the idea that he helped unleash this nuclear force in 1945 that could ultimately lead to catastrophe at any point, um, a third world war, as we find ourselves now terrifyingly confronting. And, and, and if things went horribly wrong, you know, the extinction of, of mankind, which was a fear that very much haunted him in his older years when I knew him. So I guess the biographer in me um, found that in, in trying to understand my grandfather and uh, what was a very emotional and painful legacy in my family, I then really had to go to the evidence, um, away from emotion to the hard facts. So I, I had to look, as it were, um, at the record with a disciplined and dispassionate eye. I had to sort through hundreds, thousands of letters and diaries and scientific reports and memoirs and congressional records. Uh, there are acres and acres of army memorandums. Um, there was the human testimony, his colleagues, his fellow scientists, the politicians, the policymakers, all of whom were present at the decision of, of making and dropping the bomb, all of whom, of course, were fallible. Uh, their judgment uh, narrowed, uh, blinkered, as it were, by their incomplete knowledge of what was taking place at the time the ultimate ramifications. Um, then there was a, the five foot shelf of books, uh, re revisionist histories as they're known. Uh, actually it wasn't a five foot shelf, there were probably 10 five foot shelves. Um, each of them with a different interpretation of those events uh, and different conclusions about the responsibility of the men involved. Um, in fact, the best book, in my opinion, is called The Most Controversial Decision by the historian Wilson Miss Campbell. Um, so you learn from that as a historian and a biographer that truth is a very fallible thing and that history is a very fractious business. Uh, no two historians or biographers are going to agree. Um, one of my favorite writers, Hilary Mantel, the author of the marvelous Wolf Hall trilogy. She once wrote, even the driest, most data-driven research involves an element of interpretation. History is not the past. It is the method we have of organizing our ignorance of the past. It's the record of what's left on the record. 
So uh, as a biographer, you have to you have to probe, you have to probe behind the decisions and the statements to the unstated agenda, the ulterior motives to ego, to ambition, and explore sort of murky and painful questions of responsibility and morality. And in doing that biography of my grandfather, I couldn't arrive, I don't think, at, at an ultimate truth, but I felt that I could tell a very intimate close-up account of the decision-making of one man caught uh, in the crucible of history and hope that it would raise interesting questions, um, prove enlightening and uh, inspire discussion and reflection um, in my readers. Um, I think ultimately, personally, it was a desire to walk in his shoes and understand um, the agonizing uncertainty surrounding his decisions and the human ordeal um, really of being caught in such a terrible moment of history. Um, he was a private citizen, not elected official. He didn't seek that responsibility, but when he was called on, he rose to the occasion. Uh, I think I tried to tell the story in very, very personal terms. So you could sense the cost at every turn I wanted to paint a picture of history as it was lived in the minute um, and to place his life in the context of the very tumultuous times he lived in. Um, it was a search for his legacy and the extent to which my grandfather was a tremendously influential man, one of the so-called wise men as they used to call uh, those towering figures in Washington. Um, it was a sense uh, for his legacy, our nuclear legacy, and in that sense, America's legacy. Um, and as we see it every day now on the news, our nuclear legacy and responsibility in the world. So it was a large task. And uh, and I, I felt very humble taking it on. <laughs> I guess that's what I could say. <laughs> Thank you, Jeanette. That's fascinating. Uh, Rachel, would you like to tell us something about uh, the book you, have, you published some 10 years ago now? Yes, um, such a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, welcome, welcome, everyone. And so great to hear from these other biographers. As Ed mentioned, I'm the one on the panel whose work focuses on writing about other people's families, not my own. My first book about Michelle Obama's ancestors, American Tapestry, um, and my current project, a book about the enslaved families who were sold um, to save Georgetown University, are both multi-generational biographies where I tell the story of one family over time, across centuries, in fact. So I hope that this might be um, useful to people who are interested um, in writing about other people's families. and more specifically to um, biographers interested in writing about African-American families, um, whether their own or, or someone else's. Um, my book about Michelle Obama's ancestors emerged from my time as a Washington correspondent for the New York Times. I was covering Michelle Obama and the first family during their first year in the White House. And in the fall of that year, that first year, I wrote a story about um, the first lady's great, great, great grandmother, who was an enslaved girl named Melvinia, uh, who was valued at about $475 in the 1850s. And her great, great, great grandfather, who was a white man whose identity was a mystery. And um, this was a story that appeared on the front page of the New York Times. It was news to the first lady and her family. Um, it was discussed in the White House briefing room. And a few days later, an editor from a publishing house sent me an email and said, hey, how about a book, you know? And so uh, the book project got started from there. And the task at hand was tracing um, and telling the story of Mrs. Obama's ancestors from slavery to the White House in five generations. And if possible, identifying the white ancestors in her family tree. 
So the book ended up spanning more than a century from the early 1800s to the 1950s. I, I pretty much ended with her grandparents. And I had two very different periods to tackle, um, you know, from kind of the early, early 20th century back, um, a period where there were obviously very few family members still alive and able to walk me through memories and records um, from that time. And from um, the Jim Crow Great Migration period, um, where a number of relatives had memories and photographs and records. Um, each period had their own challenges, and I'll start with the earlier period first. As you may know, enslaved people were considered property. And what that means is that African Americans are often a fleeting presence in um, early documents before the Civil War. Um, they were marginalized and forced into illiteracy, right, by laws that prohibited them from learning to read and write. And so that means very few letters, uh, diaries. Um, they don't appear in the census by name until after the Civil War. And sometimes I felt like I was writing about ghosts who had kind of passed through this world um, without leaving much of a trace. But in fact, there are records, often fragmentary, precious snippets of information that um, woven together can um, could start uh, to build a narrative. And so I immersed myself in learning that university of universe of records. And I'll always be grateful to the genealogists and archivists and librarians and historians who have guided me along the way. Um, and what I learned is that if you are hoping to find information about the enslaved, uh, what you need to do is track the enslaver. So to tell Melvinia's story, especially in the early years before um, the Civil War, I had to rely on records from uh, the two white men um, who enslaved her. The white man who owned her when she was a child in South Carolina uh, wrote a will, which listed her by name um, when she was about six years old. And after he died, the estate records included an inventory that listed um, the names of the other uh, enslaved people on the plantation, how much they were valued for, as well as um, details about the property, um, which helped paint a picture of Melvinia's world, the spinning wheels, the coffee grinders, the tablecloths, the crops, the cattle. Um, the census records um, offered a detailed portrait of the plantation as well, and details about his family. Enslaved um, people also, you may know or may not, uh, appear in mortgages as collateral and um, in other documents too that I can describe um, if there's interest in the Q&A. Um, records after the Civil War were helpful too. People legalized their marriages and those records um, often described as cohabitation records are enormously um, useful. Um, Civil War pension records. Um, she had uh, members of, of her family, black men who enlisted in the Union Army, and those are a gold mine because they can contain affidavits where um, the men described their lives before the war. And of course, the census um, itself becomes helpful after the war. But in, in this particular instance, um, the census, the 1870 census, raised as many questions as it answered. Um, it showed, for instance, that Melvinia continued to live next door to the family um, that had enslaved her. Um, uh, after the Civil War, and that she continued to have uh, biracial children as a free woman, uh, which obviously raised questions about the white father of those children and the nature of uh, their involvement. Um, with that, I wanna to pivot to the contemporary challenges. Um, much of my work on these multi-generational biographies rooted in slavery focuses on how we live uh, with that history in the present. So with that in mind, I tracked down the descendants of the white family um, that enslaved Mrs. Uh, Obama's great, great, great grandmother, Melvinia. And I also reached out to Mrs. Obama's uh, relatives. Um, and as I was pursuing these interviews, it became clear to me that I was putting together a story that not everyone was eager for me to tell. Some of the descendants of the family um, that had enslaved um, Melvinia had no idea um, that their ancestors had been slaveholders. And you can imagine what it might be like if a reporter from the New York Times might 
call you up on the phone or knock on your door and say, uh, by the way, um, your ancestors owned members of the First Lady's family, or or still um, your ancestors or a member of your ancestors' family may have brutalized a member of the First Lady's family. Um, there are many of us that might like a connection to the White House, but that is not the one um, that most people are looking for. And I faced roadblocks with uh, Mrs. Obama's relatives as well. She was, even at that time, um, early in her time in the White House, thinking about writing a book. And she had received some advice, probably very good advice, um, from folks in the publishing industry who advised her to preserve her voice for her own book. So she was not going to do any um, interviews uh, with people writing books about her or her family. And she didn't really want relatives to do that either. So, so that was a hurdle. Um, the other hurdle, though, was um, the, the shame and silence um, about um, slaveholding and slavery um, that uh, pervaded both branches, um, many branches of her family tree. So um, how did I deal with these challenges? Um, I had to build trust. Um, and obviously that's a complicated endeavor when you're writing um, about um, someone else's family in a way that it isn't if you're writing about your own. Some people I simply wasn't able to persuade people hung up on me, slam doors, it's kind of par for the course for a journalist. But in this instance, I had some time and I kept going back and I kept going back. Um, I also involved them a bit in the search. Um, so I kept them posted when I stumbled across new records or new information. And um, curiosity is a powerful motivator. I will tell two brief stories um, in that regard. One about Mrs. Obama, one of Mrs. Obama's um, relatives. I knocked on the door, I explained who I was, and I see the door closing. And I held up a Manila envelope and said, "But did you know that your great grandmother was married twice?" And the door opened. Um, and with the um, descendants of the family that uh, enslaved Melvinia, um, I was able to build trust there too. And in the end both sides of the family were willing to share their DNA. And I was able with that, with that 21st century technology, DNA testing, to solve the mystery in her family tree and to identify those white ancestors. And of course it was the most ordinary of American stories. Um, uh, the father of Melvinia's um, biracial son was a member of the family that um, owned her. Um, Two other very quick things, and then I'll share some photos with you. Um, bringing a narrative like this to life about a family, especially when it spans this kind of time, is during which people don't have memory is challenging. And, and so just two bits of records that I would mention. One is weather, which might seem a really crazy thing, but um, if you know, for instance, a, a date, uh, a birth date, a marriage date, or whatever. Digital, um, digitized uh, newspapers can be a, such a great <laughs> source of someone being born on a, a rainy day or a snowy day or married in one. The other thing is Sanborn fire insurance records, which are amazing if you have them for the period that you're interested in. Uh, if you have an address, you can actually see the street you can see what kind of dwelling, say that there was a church, a grocery store, a butcher shop that um, your um, character walked by. Um, I use contemporaneous voices, um, had to. So um, slave narratives, um, people who are similarly situated, um, I used those kinds of voices so that I could have um, voices um, in the piece. And then the last thing I would mention is kind of um, holes, um, absence of information, which um, bedevils all biographers at some point, but if you are writing about enslaved people in particular is a, a persistent problem. Um, but you know, I found that those holes um, are actually important parts of the story. Um, it speaks to what slavery did, um, how um, it, even erased uh, people or um, in many instances erased them from the archives. And, and that's an important part of the story. And that's why excavating um, these stories and writing these multi-generational biographies is so important to me.
I'm going to quickly share my screen um, and just show you um, a couple of quick uh, photos. This is uh, Michelle Obama's first family, um, her parents um, and her brother and uh, Mrs. Obama as a baby. Um, this is Melvinia's son, um, the first lady's great, great grandfather uh, who was biracial. And um, this is a, a, a photograph of uh, the family um, that enslaved Melvinia. And the um, DNA testing suggested that uh, the man who is a little better dressed than the rest, looking off into the distance uh, with his glasses, uh, was um, the father of um, Melvinia's son. And I'll stop there. Wow. Thank you, Rachel. Bernice, I have this idea that everyone has moments in family memory where the personal collides head on with the train of history. Uh, it's, and the idea is to use family events as a kind of a stage on which things that matter for everyone can be placed and choreographed. Um, trauma, um, genocide, class, politics, race, gender, ideology, all of these things can be summoned onto that stage. When you were writing about your mother, did you feel you were speaking for more than your mother, uh, for others also? Yes, definitely. Um... Yeah, I I was I was cons I wanted to make a contribution to the literature, and I wanted my mother was a witness, and um, she she um, added a certain dimension to the experience of the camps, right? Auschwitz, slave labor camp, what it was like for this girl to be on the death march, Bergen Belsen, and the liberation. What was so her story showed a, uh, a lot of things. I mean, when it came to the very end of the war, you know, people have certain ideas about what liberation is like. People are cheering, the liberators are happy, now they're free. And it was such a complicated time, so complex. Survivors were just grappling with their loss. And hers is one of among many, many stories, but it, it does shine a light on it. Also, she um, little things that she told me turned out to be, you know, uh, really important for for the history, for much bigger stories. Just as one example, she was a little. She was thirteen years old, and she was sitting at the feet of her father, her beloved father, who had came home from this horrible Hungarian forced labor tragedy, and he was one of very few men to survive there. They had, um, there was a, a barn that was full of typhus infected Hungarian uh, laborers and the Hungarian gendarmes, the Hungarian officers set a fire to it around the perimeter. They poured gas and out of 600 uh, something men, only a handful survived. Her father survived, came home. It was a miracle. He had been away for a year and she sat at his feet and she listened in as people came from the surrounding areas to find out what happened to their loved one, their brother, their uncle. And um, he didn't have the heart to really share with them, but he did at night, he did share with his cronies, some of the older men who hadn't been deported and she listened in. So this 13 year old kid is listening into the story and 30 years later, she's telling her daughter about what she heard as a kid. And then I go to the literature and I find out it's a much, it was like the greatest tragedy of Hungarian forced laborers. And here I have another very rare eyewitness account that has been passed down through, through her to me, through this kid. 
to me. So um, yes, I felt like her testimony was really important and shed light on much bigger events. Jeanette, when you're talking about what happened to the men after the war in your family, I think somehow that writing family history is like doing a kind of psychoanalysis. You have a family, your own, on the couch, and, and the sites of conflict and neurosis are to be teased out and unraveled. Have repression and you have injury and you have and I I wonder if you were attracted to these sites of uh, trauma the the pain that your grandfather might have felt or you were um, more um, turned off by them were you did you head towards them in a, in a way uh, or did you uh, did you head away from them both uh, as a child like Bernice you know I heard these stories when I was very young very often eavesdropping uh, there was uh, as often happens in scientific families where you have mathematical genius um, it comes with uh, what is today called bipolar disorder um, back then manic depression so um, I have a very high suicide rate in my family. So my great grandfather who won the Nobel prize um, for chemistry uh, was a depressive and he had three children, my grandmother and two uncles, both my uncles committed suicide in very gruesome ways. My grandmother was uh, plagued by depression. Both my father and my uncle had problems and it runs right through my family to the present generation. So there was a lot of tragedy and turmoil going on aside from the weapons uh, legacy uh, growing up in the 60s with a grandfather who was both at the one hand heralded as a savior of, of, of World War II and a mass murderer by the 60s generation. So um, there was a lot of fraught in my family when I was growing up a small child to eavesdrop on various tragedies and uh, tense debates. Um, so I fled from it and uh, there were no journalists in my family. I became a journalist and uh, went as far from it as I could. Uh, then as I started to get older in my thirties uh, and people began to get older and, and die, I, uh, I got drawn back to it. Um, but of course, you know, you never escape your family. So the, the difficulties that I had run from uh, in my 20s, you know, you can't run from them. And so I, when I came back, then I, I was very much compelled to face them um, head on. Um, and really, um, I practiced, as I said, on, on another family. My first book, Tuxedo Park, um, begins with the um, suicide of my uncle, uh, great uncle. Um, he slid his wrist in a bathtub in New York um, he was working on a short story about the bomb, which my grandfather had to repress because it had too much scientific detail that he had from Leo Zillard and Enrico Fermi, who actually were key developers of the bomb. And um, that was a story that I had overheard as a child sitting on the top staircase, which could not be seen from my living room as um, it was discussed um, and the ramifications of it were discussed. And I was eavesdropping, I was morbidly fascinated with this suicide, which was not a topic that was allowed to be mentioned. So when you're a little girl, you know, you were fascinated by things that can't be mentioned. And um, much later, when I pursued that story um, of the short story that re was repressed, um, I really tripped onto the story of Alfred Lee Loomis, who was a very powerful a uh, scientist, a uh, family also riddled by depression like mine, um, who uh, was one of the men responsible for the invention of radar and uh, putting radar systems on allied planes, which was really the weapon that won the European war. And so it, that book, um, Tuxedo Park, came out of a childhood anecdote um, 
that I heard that I was morbidly fascinated with, I guess. Uh, and it stayed with me. It started, you know, with a great uncle and then it led to my writing about this other family. Um, to the issue of trust, um, very much helped me gain access uh, to the Loomis family, which was a very private family, because my own family's story was so parallel of a very powerful World War II figure, a uh, family riddled by depression and suicide and tragedy and the toll that the war took with these men that were absent parents, absent husbands, the families fell apart while they did great things. So my experience of that allowed me to gain access to the Loomis family. And that's how Tuxedo Park, my first book came into being. So I think perhaps you understand how you sort of get drawn into these things um, and they both help you and, 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 and aid you in, in writing about other families and it forces you to look at your own in the process. Okay. One last question for everybody. What about the first person? Who uses the first person here on the panel when writing history? You have a kind of warrant or excuse, all of us do, for using the first person when writing about your own people. Um, Rachel, you know, yeah, I was gonna say, you know, I, I actually did everything I could actually not to include myself in it. And um, when my, a friend of mine read the manuscript um, because the story, the story um, uh, in, in includes um, two women um, from uh, the Michelle's family tree, uh, an older white woman and an older black woman who end up helping me and are interested in finding out their own stories. And, uh, you know, <laughs> my friend said, you know, you're, you're jumping through hoops. You actually are a part of the story. They, they found out things because of you. They, they learned about this. They wouldn't have been <laughs> involved in this if, if you hadn't um, been involved. So even though this was obviously about someone else's family, um, I did end up um, weaving myself in just in a various, I, I did DNA testing, right? How could, how could I explain how this all came to be? So in the prologue and in the epilogue, I ultimately, um, you know, explained um, and, and wove myself in a bit. That's exactly what I did. I, I, I never use, I scrupulously uh, avoided using the first person in the, in the narrative, but um, in several of the books where it was impossible not to become part of the story uh, because I'm a daughter and a granddaughter, uh, I dealt with the family issues um, in my own role uh, in the prologue or in the epilogue, but not in the story itself. Bernice, how about you? I decided not to. I really removed myself. I th Afterwards, I thought maybe it would have been a, a more interesting book, if I, but I don't think of myself as particularly interesting. And I, I don't think of... Um, second generation or third generation. Um, we're not the ones who, who really went through these things. So, I, But there are many books by two Gs, they call them second generation Holocaust survivors and even grandchildren who are pursuing their, their family histories that they do include themselves. And it is interesting to read their personal journeys, but for my, for my, I just wanted to really take myself out of it. Maybe it was too close in a way, in, in some ways. It was, took me many, many decades to write this book. You know, again, I had to write about other people first and, and I just tried to look at my mother as this girl protagonist. In the last five minutes, I wonder if anybody would like to unmute yourself and ask a question or make an observation uh, um, which on something that we haven't touched on. Uh, stand up and be counted. If I, if I might, I mean, I see Sarah is saying here this, you were biased and criticism, you know, being objective, I mean, I'm writing about somebody whom I knew quite well, and this has emerged as an issue. Um, obviously, you've got to have this in spades if you're writing about, about family. How do, you, how do you do that? Uh, well, I, I, I don't 
I don't really believe in objective journalism per se. So perhaps I, 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 have, I don't find it as complicated. I think we're, we're never completely objective. Um, obviously, even less so when it comes to family. I, I think, you know, you have to have, you know, what do they say? Um, the sliver of ice in the heart. You, you have to be willing as a writer um, to be brutal. Um, and if you're going to go uh, and write about your own family, um, I, I believe you, you have to be willing to, to be dispassionate and to cast a dispassionate eye on on events that uh, are, are very personal to your family. Um, and it's very difficult. So, uh, and it's painful and uh, not everybody in your family is gonna like it. So uh, it has consequences that are also difficult. True. Sarah Kilborn, did you wanna say something? Hi, um, everybody, great panel. And this is sort of, Piggybacking, I, I, you know, the, the previous gentleman had mentioned that I had a question about exactly what you were just speaking to, uh, Jeanette, which is, you know, did you face bias or criticism in terms of your objectivity about being a family member? And, you know, did you feel at any point that you had to defend your choice? Um, was that a part of the process at all? Or was there a sense of just that this story has to be told? And, and that was the, you know, the, the guiding principle. Well, uh, there, everybody can answer this question just very quickly. I did not face any criticism for my objectivity, maybe it's because the book's quite critical. Um, but the only people I faced um, criticism from was my family <laughs> who didn't want me to do the book because there's a lot of uh, family dysfunction uh, that they didn't want revealed. And I had to be very careful um, about and I was very careful about anybody still alive and anybody that could be affected personally by anything I wrote, but I was not careful with the dead. <laughs> Bernice? Uh, uh, well, I wrote a dual biography, right? So I could write what I wanted about my mother and I, um, I had to be more careful because um, I also did tremendous amount of research into the brigadier's life, the liberator's life. And I, I, in the end, I ultimately um, cut some things. <laughs> but anyway, I told it as a race against time story that takes place over one year, really. It was the last very dramatic year of the war. So I really just talked about what these two protagonists had to navigate. And I, yeah, I was more careful with the Brigadier than my mom. I just told it straight the way she told, her voice is in it a lot. It's really her voice sort of channeled through me. Just the last remark. Draw down the curtain. These are three different writers, three very different books. But what all of the panelists do in common is to oscillate between the personal and the political, from the particular to the general. It's in the narrative. In each case, the camera is sort of zooming in and then zooming out. The micro history and the macro history, the family detail why political processes. It's like a dialectic that's sort of built into the storytelling. And that dialectic, I think, is what draws readers to family history when it's done right. So I want to say thank you, everybody, for joining. And thank you uh, to my co-panelists for sharing these stories. And uh, Michael, I'm going to uh, ask you to take us out uh, and shut down the store. <laughs>